you've been asking about how my wife and uh, child are doing, my child is doing great. He is uh, eight, eight weeks old now. The past two weeks have been difficult though because if you know babies, six to eight weeks is their fussy period. They just cry about anything. They cry for no reason and uh, it's hard to put him to sleep. So I found a perfect solution. Whenever he's having trouble falling asleep, I just take him into my arms and I preach to him. And he falls asleep right away. Uh, sermons are a great antidote to insomnia. Please don't fall asleep during my sermon. Um, today is the third Sunday of Advent. And the word Advent means coming. It's a Latin word that, which means coming. And the purpose of this season, the past four Sundays, uh, the last four Sundays before Christmas, is to look forward to coming uh, to the coming of Christ to earth. And I hope you guys are uh, feeling a, a season of expectation and waiting. I hope you guys are excited about Christmas. And as Christmas approaches, I want to look at the reason Jesus came. I'm sure all of you, if not all of you, have celebrated Christmas all your lives. Uh, all of you probably do something for Christmas, I would imagine. But some of us still don't understand why we have Christmas, why Jesus came. The statement that the Apostle John makes in his first epistle, chapter 3, verse 5, okay, is one of four statements, and I'll read it again, is one of four statements concerning the reasons for Christmas. So if you want to see, if you want to find out why we celebrate Christmas, 1 John is a great book to look at. Because you'll find the word appear four times in the book of 1 John. Okay? In chapter 1, verse 2, you'll see that Jesus Christ appeared to promise life. So that's one of the promises. He came to give us life. We're not going to look at that. In chapter 3, verse 8, in today's passage, you'll see the reason the Son of God appeared was to <coughs> destroy the devil's work. That's a promise of victory. Chapter 4, verse 9, you'll see another time. If you go through your uh, First John, and you'll see four times the word appear. In your translations, it might be the word manifest, which is a fancy way of saying appear. Chapter 4, verse 9, it said that Jesus Christ appeared to show God's love to us. He sent, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son uh, that we might live through him, that he appeared. The promise of love. And here, chapter 3, verse 5, the promise we're going to look at today. The promise of of forgiveness. And let me read that verse one more time just to refresh your memory. Verse 5. But you know that he appeared. You're going to underline that word appeared. So that he might take away our sins. He's talking about the forgiveness of sins. When we think of Christmas, let's do a quick informal survey. I'm going to ask you, what's the first word that comes to mind when I say the word Christmas? You don't have to answer out loud, but what's the first word? Some of you may say presents. Santa Claus, Jingle Bells, Snow, Family Giving. I guarantee you, if I did this survey with a hundred people, not one person would think of sin. Did anyone think of sin when I said Christmas? <coughs> not one person, right? It's interesting to know that many people today don't ever think about sin during Christmas. Yeah, that's one thing. But they don't mention the word sin at all, you know, during any day of the year. The sin, word sin is not a popular word. A leading psychiatrist wrote a book entitled, Whatever Happened to Sin? And he wasn't a Christian author either. But sin is something that all of us have trouble with one way or another. There's not a person listening to my voice right now that doesn't have to confess that he has a problem with sin. Every single person here has to say, I have a problem with sin. And this isn't understandable because of what sin is and because of where sin came from, and because of what sin does. If you look at the word sin in the dictionary, the word John, if we translate the word sin, okay, it's a word, it's a simple word. It just means to miss the mark. To miss the mark. And this is one of the most common words for sin in the Bible. Miss the mark. God says, here's a target you want to hit. Okay, imagine that clock is a target. You have a big bullseye in the middle. Okay, and we miss the mark. We end up hitting the balloons there. We end up hitting that, uh, the drawers there. Okay. It means to miss the mark. Another word for sin that you'll see in today's passage is the word transgression. And that, what does trans mean? When we say like transatlantic flight, 
or transportation. It just means across, right? And egress means step. It just means to step across. Now God says, here's a line, and okay, here's a line. I'm not going to step across it. He says, don't step across it. You don't go any further than this. But we say, oh, I'm going to transgress. Sin is not weakness. Sin is not just some kind of disease in our system. Sin is an ingrained, inborn rebellion against God. And this passage says sin is from the devil, which makes it an especially dangerous thing. And it leads to death. It led to the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was sinless. Now, we can't take sin lightly. We can't laugh about sin. It's easy for us to say, oh, this is just the way I am. This is my lifestyle. Don't ever excuse your sin by saying it's my lifestyle. Okay. Don't say, oh, I just can't change my lifestyle. Well, God will change your lifestyle someday. And you'll discover that some of your lifestyles, no one here, but some people's lifestyles outside, may lead to spiritual death. So what has the Lord done to solve the sin problem? The basic problem in the world today, the uh, biggest problem in the world today is the sin problem. A lot of people argue, oh, we just need better education. The people in Africa, you know, there's an AIDS crisis in Africa. We just need education. We just need enlightenment. That, those don't uh, solve anything. Okay? Um, at the heart of every problem is the problem of the heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 says this, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? So what has Jesus Christ done for you and me to solve the sin problem? Well, according to 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, our passage today, our Lord performs three very wonderful ministries to help us solve the sin problem. And if you and I will just let him do what he wants to do in our lives, we can have victory over sin. Now, what has our Lord Jesus Christ done, and what does he do? Well, verse 5 gives us his first ministry. First ministry. He died for us. Repeat after me. He died for us. He died for us. Good. It says, but you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. You might want to underline take away. That word take away, or those two words take away, is the same words that John the Baptist used. Remember, John the Baptist is uh, preaching along the Jordan River. He sees Jesus, and what does he say? He says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So the first ministry our Lord performed to solve the sin problem is by dying for us. You see, his death really explains his birth. When you look at the manger, when you go outside, maybe you go to a Lotte department store or Sunday department store, I'm sure they'll put a nativity scene. What's a nativity scene? You know, in Bethlehem, you have Jesus, you have the manger, you have sheep, you have shepherds, you have the wise men. When you see that beautiful scene, okay, you better end up at the cross. Don't look at that in isolation. When you look at the shepherds in that scene, you better end up with the shepherd giving his life up for the sheep. If you begin looking at your Christmas story with people bowing low at the manger, you better end up with people bowing at the cross where our Lord said, it is finished. His death explains his life. Don't look at the birth scene and just go, oh, that's a beautiful, pretty picture of a baby Jesus and he's birthing. Oh, look, he's get up. Don't look at that without thinking about the cross. Even his name explains his life. Do you guys know what Jesus' name means? What does Jesus' name mean? It means Savior, right? Matthew one twenty one says, You are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Okay? I can go through countless numbers of scripture where people, when they see the birth of Jesus, they always refer to it as the coming of the who? The say the Messiah or the Savior. The Christmas story is not primarily about the birth of a baby who would become a great moral teacher. It's about the profound story of the birth of the Savior. To understand the name Savior, you must understand the meaning of the word save. Right? It's a radical word. Who needs saving? Who needs saving? 
you don't need you don't need to save someone who just needs a little help. You save someone who's unable to do anything for himself. A person who is lost at sea, drowning, needs saving. A person who has stopped breathing needs saving. A savior is one who has the power to rescue people who couldn't rescue themselves. Jesus has a God-given power to save his people from their sins. Verse 5 goes on to say, In him, in Jesus, is no sin. And I don't have to tell the congregation like this that only Jesus Christ could die for our sins. There was no other good enough to pay the price for sin. Only he could unlock the gates of heaven and let us in. John tells us why only the Lord Jesus Christ could take away our sins. You'll see how Jesus is described. Look at verse 7. He is righteous. Right? The one who is right is righteous. Look at verse three, uh, chapter 3, verse 5. What does, how do they describe him? It says that there is no sin in him. What about chapter 3, verse 3? How do they describe Jesus? What sort of adjective to describe Jesus? Verse 3. Pure. He's pure. Why is he saying this? Why is he saying that he's pure? He's righteous. In him is no sin. Now, can you point to anyone on this earth and say that person is pure? Can you look at the Pope and say that person is pure? Think of the holiest person. We, uh, Nelson Mandela just passed away. Great man. Great man. He was also an adulterer. Did you guys know that? Uh, promiscuous guy. But, I mean, he was a good man, nonetheless. But you can't look at him and say he's pure. He's righteous. In him is no sin. Only Jesus Christ is a sinless one. He was sinless in his birth. Luke chapter 1 verse 35 says, So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Now why was Jesus sinless? How was he sinless? Was he sinless because Mary was sinless? No, Mary was just a normal human being. Normal human female. He was sinless in his birth because the Holy Spirit who generated his body was holy. He was sinless in his life. And the Lord Jesus Christ was the only one who could die for us. And he's the only one who could pay the price for our sins because he's the only one who is pure. He's the only one who is righteous. He's the only one who has never missed the mark. He's always hit that target bullseye. He's the only one who never rebelled against his father. This is what he said about himself. I do always those things that please my father. I have not come to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And he died for us. And in, in his death, he solved the sin problem. You see, when Jesus Christ was here on earth, there was no sin in him. In him is no sin, says John. But when he went to the cross, there was sin, not in him, but... What's the preposition we want to use? What, uh, There was sin on him. Right? Not sin in him, but sin on him. Had there been sin in him, he never could have died for us. He could have just died for himself, for his own sin. How could a sinner die for sinners? Okay? Only a Savior could die for sinners. And in him was no sin, but on him was all sin, all of our sin. God took all of, let's, let's not even think of God loves the world, you know, for God so loved the world. Let's just think of God, for God so loved me. Okay? And God took all of my filth, and all of the moral sewage in my heart, and all of the godlessness, and lying, and rebellion, and lusting, and our hatred, and wickedness, and unbelief, and God took all of my sins, and put them all in one great burden, like a big bundle, and laid them on His Son on the cross. You say, what did Jesus Christ do to help you solve the sin problem? My friend, He died for you. And the theologians tell us that sin creates three problems for us. There's a penalty of sin. What's the penalty of sin? You guys should know this. Yes, death. Good. You're good theologians. Uh, eternal judgment. And there's a power of sin. And that's the power of sin that just drags us down daily. And we feel it, right? We feel the power of sin in our lives. And we feel the very presence of sin, which is all around us. You see all around you, this world is a wicked, corrupt world. And you just see the presence of sin. I, uh, I, uh, during our prayer meeting, I told Yuri that my baby's really fussy, 
And uh, you know, eight, at eight weeks old, and she said, "She real, uh, my baby now realizes how corrupt this world is, or something like that." To this extent, he experiences what the world is really like, and it is a corrupt world. Okay, and when he died for us, he took care of the penalty of sin. Now, the Jewish people in this congregation, remember, this is a letter to a church. The Jewish people in this congregation would have understood what John was talking about. Because for centuries, they celebrated a holiday called Yom Kippur. Do you guys know what Yom Kippur means? Day of, it starts with an A. Atonement, very good. Uh, Day of Atonement. And on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would get two goats. And they just, bah, goats. My baby makes that sound. And one of those goats would die. His blood would be shed. They would just kill the goat. Have you ever seen a goat being slaughtered? I haven't, but my friends who've been to Mongolia, they've seen many goats slaughtered. It's gross. They're, uh, they would take the blood, just you know, cut its throat, and the blood would be shed, and they'd take this blood into the Holy of Holies, into the deepest part of the temple, and they'd sprinkle it on the mercy seat. And the other goat was kept alive. Do you guys know what they did with the other goat? The high priest would come out, lay his hands on the goat, confess the sins of the people of Israel. So imagine, I'm the pastor, I hold, I have this goat, I say, I confess the sins of Seminar Ministries. All the sins that you guys have committed this past week, I'm gonna, uh, this past year, I'm going to put on this goat, and they just let the goat wander into the wilderness. Okay? And it just goes as far as it wants. And the goat was bearing away the sins of the people. Uh, Psalm chapter 103 says this, as far as the east, I don't know which way is east, is that way? I'm not sure. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. My friend, in this Advent season, has Jesus Christ taken away your sins? And did he, does he have your sins and just take them away, just cast them away as far as the east is from the west? Have you trusted him? Can you point to him and say, behold, the Lamb of God who has taken away my sins, even as he's taken away the sins of the world. The penalty of sin has been taken care of. He died for us. Now you might say, Pastor, if I trust my Savior, he forgave me, and, and he took away the penalty of my sin, but I still sin. I still have a sin problem. Okay? But not in God's sight. Keep that in mind. When God forgives, God forgets and takes that record book of all your sins. Oh, he cheated on an exam today. Oh, he lied to his parents. He takes all those sins, and across that record book, he writes righteous in Jesus Christ, accepted in the Beloved. There's a second ministry, ministry that Jesus performs us, for us. In solving the problem of sin, he not, not only died for us, he also lives in us. That can be found in verses 6 through 10. Verse 6. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. Let's repeat that. He also lives in us. He also lives in us. Very good. Now, he may sin. Okay? You, you're saved. You confess Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. You're still going to sin. In fact, John tells us back in 1 John 1, 8. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And I've read, I haven't met anyone, but I've read about old ladies who say, Pastor, I haven't sinned in five years. Okay? Uh, she's a liar. Okay? If we claim we have not sinned, but make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. But that's no excuse for sinning. He says in chapter 2, 1, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So what is John saying here? Is John saying that a Christian is someone who is sinless? No. There's no sinless Christian. What is he saying? He's saying a Christian is someone who sins less. Okay? You guys know the difference? You guys get the difference? A Christian is not someone who is sinless. A Christian is someone who sins less. Okay? We don't practice sin. We don't keep, uh, the word that John uses here is, we don't keep on sinning. Okay? We're going to fall into sin, all of us, this week, maybe right after the sermon ends. Okay? Temptation will swoop down upon you. Sometimes we find ourselves fighting a tremendous battle, and sometimes we're going to give in. We don't want to, and our hearts rebel against it, and we're broken after it. 
A Christian is not someone who is perfect. A Christian is someone who is accepted in Christ, but occasionally he will sin. Now, says John, what does the Lord do to solve that problem? Not we, We've taken care of the penalty of sin, right? But now we have to deal with the power of sin. How do we deal with that? Well, there's a new life down inside. Verse 9. No one who is born of God, that's a new birth. We talk about being born again, and many of us are born again. Will continue to sin. Why? His seed, the divine nature, the implanted life of God remains in them. Now when a person becomes a Christian, God does not change the old nature God implants a new nature. And, and as long as you and I yield to that new nature and let Christ live in us, the old nature is subdued. The old nature is crucified. The old nature is not cultivated and fed and encouraged. And uh, I want to give the analogy. I always use this analogy of, we imagine two dogs living inside of us. Two dogs. One is our old nature. One is the new nature. Which dog is going to be the stronger one? Huh? The one? You have an old nature, you have a new nature. Okay? Which one's going to be the stronger one? Which one's going to dominate? The one you feed more. The one you feed more. right? And that's how it is with the Christian life. We have two natures. Okay? As long as you and I, uh, the old nature is not cultivated. We want to cultivate that new nature. We want to feed that new nature. We want to encourage that new nature. And every one of us has had this experience, I'm sure. We've trusted Christ as our Savior. We were born again with a new nature. And life became different. You guys all experience this. The old things we used to love. I don't know. Maybe some of you were clubbers. Maybe you still are clubbers. Maybe. Uh, but some of you, you used to love. But you don't love anymore. And the things we used to dislike, we begin to love. The word of God and prayer and being with God's people. I remember my boss, before she was a Christian, she would always laugh at me for praying and going to morning prayer. And now that she's become a Christian, she loves going to morning prayers. And doing the things that are right. And each of us, have some areas in our lives that have bothered us. Some habitual sin or weakness. And we begin to get victory over that as we prayed, as we walked with the Lord. And for me, I can say I was a big sarcastic guy before I became saved. My dad can attest to that probably. I was a very biting humor. And, uh, God, I, I believe you uh, you know, fixed me in that area. And perhaps you've been saved for a year, two years, ten years, and then one day that old sin comes back again, and you fell. And lots of people have this experience. And we go running to the pastor and say, Pastor, how could this have happened? You know, I haven't lost my temper like this for five years. I haven't used those words in ten years. How could this have happened? And the answer is, my friend, your old nature is just what it was ten years ago. Just what it was twenty years ago. Just what it will be twenty years from now, if the Lord doesn't return. He doesn't change the old nature. But what does he do? He implants the seed in us. He implants a new nature. And he may occasionally fall into sin, but what is the key? He doesn't go on sinning. He doesn't keep on sinning. And there are those today who live lives of immorality, but they're going to say, but we're saved. We believe the same way you believe, but our lifestyle is going to be different. I just read an article about a church in New York City. I won't name the church, but they live just like the people they want to reach. So if they want to reach ravers, if you guys want know ravers, it's clubbing, you take drugs, they'll do that just so that they can reach that. Okay. Uh, the Bible says we, the Bible clearly is against that because the Bible says we don't go on sinning because he lives in us. Now how do we do this? He tells us in 3, 6, chapter 3, verse 6. No one who lives in him, and in other versions, it'll say no one who abides in him. Abide is one of those great biblical words. But we don't use that term abide very much in everyday life. What does abide mean in just everyday English? Starts with an R. Remain. Remain. Yeah, abide just means remain. If no one who remains in him keeps on sinning. What does it mean to remain? And there's three ways we can remain in Jesus. This is the practical part. The first way we remain in the Lord is remain in fellowship. Chapter 2, verse 19. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. We remain in Christ through fellowship in the church. Okay. Is everyone whose name is on a church roster, all of you probably signed up as a church, a church member, 
Are you all saved? Are all those people's names, on the, if their names are on the church roster saved? No. John said that there were people who came to church with us. They sat in our services, and yet they left. They went out from our self, uh, fellowship. Did they lose their salvation? No, they didn't lose their salvation. They never had salvation to begin with. Okay? Uh, they were in us, but not of us. One of the ways we remain in Jesus, one of the ways we reside in Jesus, uh, abide in Jesus, is by abiding in fellowship. Don't write off the importance of fellowship with God's people. I know all of you have the internet, all of you have a television, you have an MP3 player, you probably listen to sermons, you probably have your devotional books in your library, but that, that is no substitute for fellowship in God's church. And I've seen it over and over again where people get careless about their worship. They miss a Sunday. They don't go to small groups. They don't be accountable to their neighbors, their uh, uh, fellow church believers. And they stop attending services. And when they stop abiding, what happens? They start <coughs> sinning. So we abide in the fellowship. Over in 2.24, we abide in the Word. See that what you have heard from the beginning remains or abides in you. And some of us say, oh, I don't have time for the Bible. I don't have time for meditation. I don't have time for study. No time to get into the Word. But we have plenty of time to sin. How do we abide in Him? We abide in Jesus Christ through the Word. How do we remain in Him? We also remain in Him through the Holy Spirit. We walk in the Spirit. Verse 27. As for you, this is chapter 2, 27. As for you, the anointing you receive from Him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as His anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in Him. He's saying, I can't teach you spiritual truth. The Holy Spirit has to take what I'm teaching you and make it real to you. Otherwise, it's secondhand. So after this sermon is over, ask the Holy Spirit, make this word real to me. Okay. When did you get the anointing of the Holy Spirit? When you are saved. So what do we do? We abide, we remain in the fellowship. The importance of small groups, the importance of uh, attending services. We abide in the word. We spend time in the Word. Abide in the Spirit. And what happens when we do those three things? We abide in Jesus Christ. We remain in Jesus Christ. And whenever you abide or remain in Jesus Christ, and He remains in us, we don't go on sinning. And we walk in victory. I've said this several times before, but I'll say it again. The life of victory is a life in the Word of the Spirit, in the fellowship of God's people. And if you don't take time every day to fellowship in the Word through the Spirit in prayer, there's going to be defeat. So He lives in us. So He died for us, first ministry. Second ministry, He lives in us. There's a third ministry I will perform. Okay? He will come for us. He's coming for us. Chapter 3, verse 1 through uh, 5. The first three verses, 1 through 3. It says, and this will take care of the very presence of sin. We, but we know that when Christ appears, okay, this is verse uh, 2, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. This is the second coming of our Lord Jesus. And the second coming is just as certain as the first coming. You can trace through the Old Testament scriptures, and it shows the plan of his first coming. And everything, everything went according to plan. All the predictions about where he would be born, who he would be born to, came true. And you can read through the New Testament scriptures and find his plan for his second coming. And he's going to come according to his plan. Okay? Now, the question is, does it say, and we know that if Christ appears? No, what does it say? We know that when Christ appears. When will he appear? Um, Jesus spoke to me yesterday and he said he'll be coming uh, October 31st, 2014. So get ready. No, uh, if I said that, you should uh, kick me out of the church. We don't know when he's going to appear. What signs are we going to look for? I don't know. Okay? He could come today. I really wish that he came today. The last prayer in the Bible, I've mentioned this probably 10 times already. The last prayer in the Bible is, come 
quickly for Jesus, right? A Maranatha. And he's coming for us. And when he comes for us, this is going to take care of the presence of sin. He's coming for us because this is, we're his children. This world isn't our home. God's children are not of this world. Don't get comfortable with this place. Don't get too comfortable with Seoul. Or don't long for Chicago. I'm from Chicago and I, uh, you know, I lived in LA most of my life. Don't long for those places. Long for heaven. The world is not going to understand us. The world doesn't even want us. We're not of this world even as Jesus is not of this world. We don't belong here. Why are we here then? We're here to be lights and salt, right? We're left here to witness and to win, but this isn't our home. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. He's coming for us, and when he comes for us, he's going to finish what he started. So he died for me. That takes care of the very penalty of sin. Let's repeat that. He died for me. He lives in me. That takes care of the power of sin. And he comes for me. Repeat after me. He comes for me. And that will take care of the very presence of sin. My body is going to be transformed. I'm going to have a glorious body. I can't wait for my new body. Uh, hopefully I shed a few pounds in the afterlife. I'll have a new home. A whole new atmosphere, a whole new environment where everything will be pure and glorious and holy and righteous and loving and all to the glory of God when He comes. Now it seems to me our Lord Jesus Christ has done a very great job of solving the sin problem. Moses, and uh, if you listen to East Yung Moksanim's uh, Reverend Lee's service today, he talked about that. Moses couldn't solve the sin problem. right? And Moses gave the law, it accentuated the sin problem. Uh, John the Baptist didn't solve the sin problem with baptism. You know, I've met many people, and this is probably true of European countries where they have state religions, people are baptized into the church, and they just believe that, oh, because I'm baptized, I'm saved. Okay? They think they're being, by being baptized, they're going to solve the sin problem. It does not. John the Baptist did not solve the sin problem. Jesus did. How did Jesus bring in righteousness and solve the sin problem? Through death, burial, and resurrection. He was manifested. He appeared to take away our sins. This is the only solution to the sin problem. Now you know this. John says this. You know that now we know Jesus Christ appeared to take away our sin. Okay? Now that you know this, what are you going to do about it? You say, what should I do about it? You should trust him. If you don't know Jesus, you should come to him and say, Lord Jesus, I believe you died for me. I believe that you bore my sins on your body on the cross, and I trust you now as my Savior. I will receive you. Implant that new nature, the seed that we just read, within. Forgive me. Take the record of my life, and across that record, please write accepted in the Beloved One. Wash away my sin. And then once we've been saved, and that this is where most of us are probably, we can come to Him and say, Lord, I want to abide in you. I want to remain in you. And I want you to remain in me. I want to abide in the fellowship. I want to abide in the Word and abide in the Spirit because I want you to give me victory over the power of sin. As Jesus Christ was raised up from the dead, so we also should walk in newness of life. No reason for us to be stumbling and falling when Jesus Christ is living in us. And then we spend our thoughts and our minds and our hearts lifted upward to heaven, saying, He's coming for me. The re return of Jesus Christ is a tremendous motivation for godly living. All who have this hope in Him purifies themselves just as He is pure. Brothers and sisters, He appeared to take away our sins. That is the meaning of Christmas. The greatest problem in the world today has been solved. The sin problem, because He died for us. Because He lives in us, and He's coming for us. The Son of God has come to solve the sin problem for you. Now, will you receive and trust Him? Should you respond to God's offer of forgiveness in Christ? This Christmas, I know this didn't seem like a typical Christmas, but if you understand this fact, then you truly understand Christmas. Because then... It will be truly a time to celebrate. For you will have the greatest gift you can ever receive. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, if our hearts were somehow projected on a screen, and we, let alone others, could see what our sins were really like, oh God, how we would cry out for mercy. 
Forgive us, Lord, for we have covered sin. We have whitewashed it. We have redefined it. Sometimes we've approved of it. We've argued about it. We've excused it. But, oh Lord, the one thing we need more than anything else is to be saved from sin. And I pray today that people would come and trust Jesus Christ and be born again and receive the new nature and find in Christ forgiveness. I pray for believers. Lord, you know the needs of our own hearts. We need to walk as he walked and be as he is in this world. I pray that in this Christmas season and every season, we might live as those who have a Savior and who are looking for him to come again. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.